2023 was a pretty good year for games. The year itself was bleh, but I actually found a lot to love. The hype of Future Redeemed and Mario RPG, the release of the Mario movie, and finally joining YouTube all made it almost worth it in the end. I will admit, I was struck with multiple illnesses during the first half of the year, and I broke my foot and missed out on summer, but I think everything was okay in the end. I was ready to move on to 2024. Maybe things would get better. They didn't get better. I was in a very dark place for most of January and February. I was struck with a terrible depression. So many online figures I looked up to either announced their departure or were exposed for varying degrees of bad things. I felt like 2024 was my personal hell. A lot of my friends wished for it all to end. I wanted it to end. I just wanted to not wake up one day, I just wanted it to all be over, and yet, life continues on. I know it probably seems like whiplash for me to open a video about my game of the year with this dark subject matter, but I feel like truly need to express how desperate I was for this year to get even slightly better. I really did put on a mask at the beginning of the year, especially with my first video. I still plan on uploading 10 minutes minimum to this channel every month, but I pretend that things were hunky-dory when they in fact were not, and I apologize for that. I want to prove I'm a reputable source for my own opinions, and this is how. To brighten things up, games helped me through some dark times. There was a lot of fantastic games from 2023, so many in fact that I haven't played nearly all of them. There are so many games I think I'll love. Lethal Company, Sea of Stars, Hi-Fi Rush, Pizza Tower, Baldur's Gate 3, just to name a few. I think they'll be amazing and when I play them, I might make a part 2 to this video. But that's besides the point. I'm here now to present the games I played this year, and the ones I played were stellar. There were so many games I bonded with, and even if some of them took time to love, I think every game on this list holds a special place in my heart. In this video, I'll be giving reviews of every game I played from this year. The order I talk about these games will be randomized to create suspense, and even though it may become obvious which are my highest contenders, I hope to create an interesting and engaging video. So let's begin this trek. This is my Game of the Year 2023 video. The first game to discuss is... Let me ask you a question. What is the potential of 2D platformers? I was originally under the impression that they can be masterpieces, games like Donkey Kong Country 2 and Celeste prove that, but 3D platformers will always be superior. The movement and sandbox nature and scale of 3D platformers would always give them an advantage over left to right 2D platformers. Now let me ask you another question. Why has the latest 2D Mario soared to the top of my favorite Mario games list, above both 3 and World, above the majority of RPGs, and even above a lot of the 3D Marios, including 64 and maybe even Galaxy? How could a simplistic left to right game beat out all time masterpieces for me? Let's start with basic mechanics. Mario Wonder is a left to right platformer that innovates on everything I love about platformers. The controls are literally perfect. This is the best feeling 2D platformer I've ever played, only rivaled by the Donkey Kong games. The Mario gang feels so fluent and perfect and already make the game feel like bliss. The movement is only half the battle, however, as the level design is equally important. These levels are strikingly unique. Every level offers some new unique idea, with a level built around that idea. Pretty much every idea present is really fun, especially any gimmicks based around pulling things or bouncing on things. There's also essentially a tier system of circumstances that can change how you approach a level. At the bottom is power-ups. Usually a level will provide you with the power-up that best suits that level, but you can bring any power-up you wish. The power-ups available in this game are the Fire Flower, Elephant Shroom, Drill Shroom, and Bubble Flower. Each of these power-ups drastically change your movement, allowing for paths and options previously unavailable. You unfortunately lose your power-up if you get hit or die, so they're essentially a shield. This has been a staple of Mario games for years, and this is the most basic form of ability in this game. There's a considerably smaller pool of power-ups in this game compared to the other Mario games, however, and there's two reasons for this. The first reason is the incredible depth of the power-ups, and the second is the new badge system. Badges provide a new preset ability of your choice to you before you enter a stage. They act as a permanent movement buff in the level, though they aren't limited to movement. They feel like an idea lifted from other great 2D platformers and perfected here. Every single badge is enjoyable to use. Whether they give you a glide, give you an upwards wall bounce, or make you swim like a dolphin, these abilities completely transform how you play the game. And when in tandem with power-ups, can sometimes add so much movement freedom and depth that it challenges movement options in most 3D Marios. The highest and final tier is the new Wonder Flowers. These can completely transform a level, changing the gimmick, adding new level design to explore, or changing you in some way, usually giving you new movement. Wonder Flowers are this game's big new gimmick, and they're so unique and refreshing that I genuinely think they revolutionized 2D Mario. This feels like something that will be iterated on for years. The best part of it all is that the movement always suits the level. You can fly, glide, bounce, or slide through every level, leading to some of the most satisfying replayability. 
the collectibles add extra value to replaying levels. The purple tank coins give you a big bonus amount of purple coins to spend, and are usually in extra risky or challenging areas. The wonder seeds are this game's stars, and you can get them by completing a level or by completing a wonder flowers challenge. I will admit one tiny issue is that if you skip a level's wonder flower, the levels don't always have a ton extra to offer, but that's a really minuscule issue. Actually, I think I'll go over my other two issues right here. I don't like the invisible block plaza levels, though I appreciate the idea, and the non-Bowser Jr. bosses are kinda nothing. I also think Mario and Luigi's voices are only okay, the new voice actor is the definition of the bare minimum. No shade to the voice actor, I just don't feel his voice fits Mario too well. That's all my issues with this game, everything else is wonderful I guess. Every single level is a blast, every new badger power-up adds so much depth, this is genuinely one of the most fun games I think I've ever played. There's never a non-plaza dull moment, and I genuinely think I'm going to replay this game a lot. Some other things I love are the music and visuals. The music didn't impress me at first, and to me this was the game's weakest aspect, but later on they introduced some absolutely amazing songs, some that genuinely shocked me in how great sounding they were. The visuals are really unique, and my god, they just look so good! The amount of playable characters is always great, though I never play a non-human character because I like having power-ups. The world maps are so wonderfully designed, and I love the explorable bits, the sounds are so satisfying, coins have a purpose other than lives, this is just such a good game. This is genuinely one of the best games I've ever played, and this is a contender for my favorite 2D platformer. At the time of writing, I haven't technically beaten the game, I just don't have enough time to, but I've done every world except for World 3. Oh, that reminds me, you can play the worlds out of order, and I did World 5 first and went backwards. Also, every world has like a cute mini story, and there's actually dialogue? This game's so good! Anyways, I genuinely love this game, and I'm excited to finish it. I hope that it keeps amazing me, and I'm excited to talk about it more. Maybe I'll make a full review one day. Future redeemed, my sweet, beautiful child. Xenoblade is my most favoritest thing in the whole damn world, and this game is just so amazing. It has incredibly fun combat, amazing exploration, a great story that I may or may not have bawled my eyes out to at the end, and phenomenal music. The problem is that I already made a video talking about a ton of my feelings on the game, so there's not much left to say here. If you want the TLDR, I love it, but it's too short. I have a few other minor gripes, but my main issue is that I want more of these characters. However, I won't let that take away from how utterly amazing this game is. Go play it for the love of God, and if you want to watch my best of video, watch my future Redeem video. The original Mario RPG is one of my favorite childhood games. I have many nostalgic memories of playing it on Super Retro 16 on my dad's phone, and also playing it on my tablet when I turned 9 on that very same app. I remember playing it at a Christmas family gathering, at the teen program at my local YMCA after middle school and on road trips. The music still brings a lot of nostalgia and the graphics are to this day very cute. In saying this, I hope you can understand why I flipped when Mario RPG Remake got announced. I hadn't played it in years and was overwhelmed with joy that one of my favorite childhood games was getting the HD treatment. I decided then and there to try to replay the game. I had never gotten past that infernal maze when I was younger, so I sat down on my computer, booted up a ROM, and dove straight into the world of Mario RPG. And my time with it was like, fine? It was playable, but the combat felt archaic, the missable collectibles gave me anxiety, and I just couldn't get into it. It may have also been the setting. At that time in my life, my PC was in my family's kitchen, so there was no privacy or comfort, and it also may have been that I wasn't really looking for that type of game at that moment. Whatever the reason may be, I couldn't beat it. I got past Moleville and gave up. Months later, around November of 2023, I bought the remake and warily dove in, not knowing what to expect. Let's just say those first impressions from my time in my family's kitchen changed. Mario RPG is a wonderful little game that just keeps giving. The combat, fast and fluent. The story, simple but understandable. The exploration, better than the bare minimum Thousand Year Door gave. This game had honest-to-god platforming, and it really made it feel like a culmination of what makes Mario and Final Fantasy so special. A fun world that's a joy to hop around and explore, more slow-paced gameplay and story with interesting twists. Let's start with the combat. Most encounters are blisteringly fast, only taking a few turns. This game introduces action commands. If you hit the button at the right time when attacking, you do an additional hit. Time pressing the button to when you get hit, you shield it. Do a quick minigame when using a special, deal more damage. 
I will admit most special attacks reuse the same action commands from other specials, but it still adds an extra bit of linking the player to the character, putting in a fun Mario twist that would evolve on and get improved on for years to come in subsequent games. This remake fixes one of my biggest gripes with the original, making it clear what timing should be for attacks. There wasn't a very clear indicator in the SNES version for some attacks, but here you get an indication telling you when to press the button. Once you get the hang of it, the indicator backs off. There are lots of small tweaks to combat, but the last big thing this game added is a meter that fills up for every subsequent successful action command. You get a chain mechanic where doing action commands fills it up more and more, adding great flow to battle. Once you fill it up, you unleash a unique triple attack, combining all your current party members into a beautiful cinematic attack that either deals big damage or gives big buffs. This all sounds great, but there are two big issues with the combat. For one, this game is far too easy, most enemies die quickly, and you're showered with help from the game. The only time I remotely struggled in the main story was the ghost ship, but even then it was barely a big deal and I still briskly got through it. The second big issue is that most Mario RPGs after this game improve on this formula of combat by a lot. Don't get me wrong, this game combat has aged pretty well, in this version at least, but subsequent games have done a lot more with the combat. TTYD has some of the best combat in any RPG ever, and while I haven't played the Mario and Luigi games, they seem to have very fast and fluent combat. It all comes to make this game look a little basic, but when looking at this game independently, it's a great combat system. The combat system especially shines in the super bosses. The dojo was a very fun challenge to get through my first time, and I absolutely adore the new super bosses. Oh, big spoiler warning, skip to here to not see this. I kind of thought the Punchinello rematch was a little too obscure to figure out you need to punch the bombs to reverse them, and Jonathan Jones just dragged on forever and ever, but they were mostly all great. I haven't beat Culex 3D yet, but wow is this fight really cool and unexpected, and my attempts so far have been really fun. This remake needed super bosses and they're all mostly great. My last gripe with the combat is the 100 super jump challenge. I was originally going for 100% and I've done pretty much everything. I found every secret chest, aced every minigame, beat almost every super boss, and I've even played 50 godforsaken, painforsakingly slow rounds of that stupid, dumb memory game. I have short term memory and had to take a picture of every card layout, so here's every single picture I took. It was like 2 hours straight and it was garbage. The thing that's really stopped me is the 100 super jump challenge however. I might do it one day, but I don't feel I have the right motor skills to be able to do it. I can't find a timing, a rhythm, or any joy out of it. It's tedious and should have been made far easier or have just been removed from the game. Spending 6 hours grinding out one trick is not fun. Okay, now onto one of my favorite parts of RPGs, the exploration. This game is very fun to run through. You can find lots of secrets in the overworld, there's occasional platforming to spice things up, and the areas you go to are varied, and it's just overall a lot to enjoy. Some of my favorite levels are Land's End, it's so gigantic and feels like a real adventure, Booster's Tower for having a killer theme and a great sense of progression, and the first two levels just because I'm nostalgic. I also love all the towns, they're varied and have so much fun dialogue. It's also where they put most of the game's easter eggs and secrets, and also the best music. Music. Any of these towns could be my favorite, honestly. They're all so excellent, and I'm excited to return to them on replays. My big check for if a Mario RPG succeeds at having the best of both worlds is if you can jump on the furniture in a house. And not only can you do that, you can find secrets and easter eggs. I really do feel like I'm playing a no-bars Mario game, and even though later on platforming can get frustrating because of the camera angle, I vastly prefer having it over bland hallways or empty arenas. To help with the exploration is the music, and I think that the SNES version of Mario RPG has my favorite Mario SD. So many tracks go so hard, and the tracks just keep getting harder and harder and harder. The remake has brand new orchestral versions of the songs, and while they're pleasant, they don't hit as hard as the originals. The originals had this perfect vibe, and while the new ones are probably objectively better, I feel the original OST is more fun to listen to. I swap between the versions frequently when playing, though, mostly for variety. Music is reused a fair bit, but considering how big this game is, that's understandable. The last thing to talk about is the story, and it's alright. There's a great flow with lots of fun surprises, and the writing is pretty good and made me laugh a good amount, and the characters are solid. Mario, Peach, and Bowser are their usual enjoyable characters. Gino and Mallow, however, are, look incredibly unique and are also great characters. Mallow is a young boy who's very emotional and learns to control his emotions. He has a good arc with a couple surprising twists that I won't spoil here, but he's generally very likable. Gino is a straight man, and if Mallow looks weird for a Mario game, Gino looks alien. 
He fits in perfectly with the party, however, as the more serious straight-to-business character. I will admit he's not as interesting story-wise as Mallow, but he's still an enjoyable presence and works decently as the more wise prophecy character. Gino for Smash? Put Gino and Mallow in as a hybrid! I will admit the story itself is a little basic, but the events leading up to the finale were all fun, and even though there isn't anything here to challenge me or emotionally connect to me, it was still serviceable at worst, and the ending made me tear up. It's an overall solid story that, say it with me, has been improved on in most of the entries after this game. Some other thoughts on this game are that the visuals are great, they're very cute and perfectly translated the original vibes over. The cutscenes are stunning and are possibly the prettiest stuff on Switch. The controls feel nice and the 8-directional stuff never gets in the way. Grinding out frog coins in the post-game is really lame and there should have been better options. There should also just be better options for completionists in general. But overall, this game is a very fun romp, and even though most future Mario RPGs improve on this game, it's still a cult classic and is undeniably one of the Switch's best RPGs. Pokemon Sleep is maybe this year's biggest surprise for me. What seemed like a cute idea for a mobile game that I'd forget in seconds turned out to be a useful tool in helping one of the most important aspects of my life, my sleep. The format for Pokemon Sleep is incredibly simple. You have a few Pokemon on the field and they collect candy and berries for you. You can cook meals for your Snorlax three times a day. When you fall asleep, the game tracks your sleep and then gives you a report in the morning of how well you slept, giving a graph and audio it picked up overnight. After that, certain Pokemon will have appeared on the field. You first take pictures of their different sleeping positions, then you can feed them biscuits to attempt to add them to your party. It's an incredibly charming concept, and I see this game as potentially the most beneficial game you could play that's on this list. I will admit I have some serious problems with dropping this game, but I definitely think that's a me thing. With a mobile game you'd expect shitty phone game ads and microtransactions all over, but thankfully there's no ads and the microtransactions are handled graciously and are made apparent so younger players won't be spending 2000 bucks on sleep points. I guess if I had one problem with this game, it's that a few cutscenes are a bit too long. Every time a Pokemon uses an ability, you get to see a cutscene of them using it, which gets very grating. There's also a lot of longer story segments in the game, which can get a bit tedious at 3 in the morning when I finally take in my melatonin and I just want to go to bed. But despite that issue, I still play this game occasionally. I love the vibrations from your phone when you slide your finger across a ton of berries your Pokemon just found. I like the little tips the game gives you about your sleep when you cook. I like the art style and vibes. I like that this game wants to make a change and help people get better sleep schedules. I can see myself using this app for the rest of my life, so thank you Pokemon Sleep. Thank you for striving to make a difference in health across the world. Fortnite is a game I've scoffed at for years now, never really understanding the hype. I think the real nail in the coffin was when back in 6th grade, my mortal enemy would constantly say that Fortnite was better than my beloved Banjo-Kazooie. And his reason? He said Banjo-Kazooie's graphics sucked. So I'm here now to say Fortnite on Switch looks worse than Banjo-Kazooie on CTR. I win, you lose, I have defeated you! Now that I've got that out of my system, Fortnite's f***ing awesome! I know some of you may be confused why I'm covering it in a 2023 Game of the Year video if it was released in 2017, and that's because this year had a major update that brought in three new games. There was also a lot of new maps this year, and to be honest, I've been killing to talk about this game. The two maps I've got to play this year were the OG and the Train map, and both have been a blast. The OG map is my favorite of the two, with tons of recognizable landmarks and great terrain for shootouts, plus the Meteor. The second map is the TRAIN! And while I prefer the OG, this map is still fun. It's definitely a lot less fun if you're on your own, it's really easy for someone to sneak up on you or snipe you from a hill, but in teams this map is awesome. The train's a bit underplayed, but there's lots of places to go, including Peter Griffin's house. I will admit I definitely prefer to play it in no build, but build is also helpful on this map, especially with all the hills and drop-offs. There's a lot of things to find in the world, and the fun really never ends. This might just straight up be my favorite multiplayer game, just because of how enjoyable riding around on a motorcycle with a pal and then getting into a sniper battle is. I already have lots of good memories with this game, and as much as younger me would hate my guts, I've really grown a connection to this game. It's honestly comforting to me now, and I don't regret for a second picking it up. We're not done yet though, I have a few slight problems with the standard mode. 
As much as I love the scavenging system in this game, when you're constantly on the search for blue, purple, and golden weapons, it kinda sucks ass when you land and immediately get shot because someone got more lucky and found a gun first. I think like a minute grace period once you land would be nice, and would maybe make shitty instances like this happen a lot less. I should also mention the servers and optimization. It's impressive I can play with hundreds of people from across the world in one map, but this game can lag like crazy at the weirdest time, and I notice lag spikes will occasionally happen when I'm in mid-combat, which is not a good thing for a survival game. The areas also take an ungodly amount of time to load in textures and assets, giving Switch players an unfair disadvantage. I should also mention the terrible UI. This game was very intimidating when I first started playing, and part of it was how terrible navigating the menus was. They constantly greedily shove microtransactions in your face, asking for more money. You had to pay 30 bucks for the godforsaken Ninja Turtles. In comparison, it makes the battle pass seem very generous with how little it costs for how much you get, but it's still a lot of money. Okay, now that I've gotten the most obvious, played out, annoying to Fortnite, as I'm sure, part out of the way, let's talk about all the other modes that have been added. The first mode is Rocket Racing, and I'll admit racing games are not my thing. This mode is nice visually, it feels good the first few times when you play it, but it's devoid of personality and replayability. You do this weird automatic drift, and it's so strange to get used to, but other than that, I have nothing to say. It's very bare bones. It would probably have been better if if you could see your character you spent 15 bucks on driving around in the car, but they didn't do that. Overall, a perfectly serviceable average mode I don't play too often. 4 out of 10. The next mode they added was Fortnite Festival, which is a Guitar Hero-esque rhythm game. The controls are pretty strange, and it's scummy how expensive the song can get, but this is in my opinion the most fun mode they added. I've played it a lot with one of my besties, and we really enjoy jamming out together a lot, watching our characters play their little hearts out. The rhythm game itself feels responsive and has fun high score mechanics, and the visuals are very nice. You also get to select one of four instruments, and they're all fun to use, even though they're similar. Despite how basic this mode is, the great memories and general quality carry this mode to a 6 out of 10. The final mode is the biggest one, the LEGO mode. I remember being psyched to see that during the event, and hopped into a friend's world. I enjoyed slowly growing my arsenal, finding materials in the overworld, crafting my house, but god this mode is so janky! Structures crumble at the slightest tug, the temperature system's all kinds of screwed, and during the early game when night comes, you can't do anything. This is by far the most mechanically interesting mode they added, and exploring the world and collecting materials is really fun. There's so much potential in this mode, but the lack of polish makes me wary to return, and even though I want to get into it, the things holding it back forced me to give it a 5 out of 10. Great potential and enjoyable experience, but very frustrating, which kind of makes it right in the middle. An average experience. Now I will admit, you're probably a little underwhelmed by my experiences, and I couldn't blame you. But the fact these are modes you can play for free in a free-to-play game makes having them nothing but a net positive. They only add to how much there is to do in this game, and make it so that no matter what, you never have a reason to put this game down if you don't want to. They're overall average as individuals, but great in a package, and to me that makes playing them a worthwhile experience. The last thing I'd like to bring up is the creative mode. I've had so many fun experiences in creative mode, playing on fun maps with my friends, seeing people's genuine creativity on display, those memories are irreplaceable. To me, this game is irreplaceable. Even though at the time of writing, I'm less interested in playing it nowadays, the time I had was great and I'd do it all again. I feel like Tears of the Kingdom is by far the most divisive Zelda game. On one hand, there are some people who think this is easily the greatest Zelda game. They think the building is fun, the exploration top-notch, the story is amazing, and this game does no wrong. To them, it's a perfect game, undeniably a 10 out of 10 masterpiece, and a good sign of what's to come. Others may feel this game is flawed, in the same vein that Skyward Sword or Wind Waker is. Lots of missed potential, seemingly flaws or tears in the seams in every facet of the game, and whether they liked it or not, most of these people seem to have overwhelmingly negative opinions about the game. I unfortunately fall into the second camp. I love Tears of the Kingdom. I think it improves on a lot of Breath of the Wild's shortcomings, and I think it's an immersive world I could explore forever and ever, and I think it's worth the $70 price tag. I also, however, think this is the weakest 3D Zelda. Granted, I haven't played Skyward Sword, and it's been a while since I played Wind Waker or Twilight Princess, but right now I can easily say I'd prefer to replay those games over this one. I barely see this as a bad thing, however. This giant titan of a game is less good than that giant titan of a game is barely a critique. And I hope to show that despite Tears of the Kingdom's flaws, I do love this game. 
Well, I don't think doubling down on Breath of the Wild was the right choice, it wasn't a bad one. Here's the results from this experiment. Let's start with my favorite new thing about this game, the shrines. I'm not really a fan of their color palettes or how they work with the lore, or that it's way harder to tell if you've beaten art already just from a glance on the overworld, but the new building mechanics definitely make the shrines more interesting. I love the combat shrines that take away your equipment, I love the shrines where they have you transport a crystal, etc. I will admit there are a few too many shrines with one or two very simple puzzles, but the ones I enjoyed were great. I also love the exploration. I think that the reused map hurts me a little less than the average player, since I could explore Breath of the Wild's maps a hundred thousand times times moreover, but I will admit I wasn't very surprised often by what I found. It was very similar to what I found in Breath of the Wild. However, the remixed regions were nice to see. I also love the new caves and wells. They helped the world to feel even more intricate and fleshed out, and they were a good example of a time where Ascend was incredibly helpful. There's also two brand new layers to the map, the sky and the depths. While the sky is admittedly underwhelming, it's still a welcome addition. I enjoyed most of the puzzles and boss fights I found in the sky, and jumping down from high points into Hyrule was always amazing. In addition, they added the adept. In addition, they added the Depths, which is a pitch black counterpart to Hyrule. You have to create your own way to see in the treacherous and dark abyss, and there's ways to permanently lose health until you find a big glowy flower or return to the surface. There's also tons of malice infected enemies out for blood, along with new ones that only live underground, dropping valuable resources upon being killed. Scurrying around the depths is thrilling, and finding ancient ruins or giant monsters is always exciting, it makes up for the fact that the terrain underground isn't all that interesting. It's also the place where the new build feature can shine the brightest. Literally. I'm going to be entirely honest about the building, this was the new feature that excited me the least. I want to keep the positivity train going though, so I'll say the things I like first. I think building is perfect for shrines, the limited materials you have forcing you to solve a puzzle works perfectly for Zelda, and while the builds can take a bit too long to create sometimes, they allow for unlimited creativity and make different solutions abundant. I also really love the fact that you can glide around on a glider. It's helpful in the depths or on the surface, but it really blows me away in the sky when I can soar over the land below me. It truly is a spectacle, and despite the pretty stupid limitations of the gliders, they're incredibly helpful and make traversing fun. And last but not least, sometimes I like building. It's cool that I can build a car to get over a field, or that I can make a flying machine to skip sections. It's all insanely unique, and seeing the mind-blowing creations of other people online is always a good time. Despite all of this, the building just isn't for me. It takes way too long, is very janky, and really slows the pace of the game down. Most creations I make seem to barely ever work, and the terrain of Hyrule isn't really fit for the things with wheels. When the opportunity is given, I'll usually take a horse or speed elixir over a car. I'm also very mixed on fusing. On one hand, it allows for many unique weapons, all that can be used efficiently if you're creative. On the other hand, fusing kinda sucks. Normal weapons on the surface are all rusted now, which means they last 5 seconds and deal like 2 damage. This heavily encourages fusing, but to the fuse you have to slowly open the menu, take out the thing you want to fuse, which will usually just be a random high damage monster part, and then slowly individually fuse the parts to each weapon. The weapons still don't last very long, however, and there's no easy way to get good weapons. In order to get the best optimal weapon in Tears of the Kingdom, you need to find a rusted weapon, usually at a monster camp, fuse a monster part to that weapon, break it, Go into the depths, find a soldier holding a fixed version of that weapon, fuse another strong part to it. All for one weapon that will break inevitably. In Breath of the Wild, if you want to get a good weapon, you have to, go to a monster camp and pick up a good weapon. I valued a lot of my weapons in Breath of the Wild. In this game, I'll just waste my weapons. F*** it, they're gonna break anyways. It's a cool idea that just doesn't pan out. It gets worse with arrows, though. There's still no crafting system, and elemental arrows are gone, so for every arrow, you have to load an arrow in your bow, open the fuse menu, and scroll until you find the part you want to fuse. Wait for the game to load. Watch the same animation of Link loading the arrow, and then finally, fire the arrow. For each individual arrow. If you could use parts you find to craft weapons and arrows, none of this would be a problem. I think fusing is a fun idea and a good step in the right direction, but needs major work. To go back to being more positive, I love the other two abilities. I already talked positively about Ascend. It's my favorite new ability from this game, and it's incredibly cool. It's perfect for this type of game, it's just like the best ability? The other new ability is Rewind, which is a perfect evolution of Stasis. Instead of freezing things, you rewind the trail of the item, and this in tangent with building is an amazing ability. If an enemy throws a bomb barrel at you, you can rewind it and blow them up. If you see a rock fall from the sky, you can ride it up to get a great position for paragliding. It also can be used multiple times with no recharge time, making it an awesome new ability. All this freedom makes the game sound like a sandbox with tons of toys and sand but no activities to do when you're bored. But fear not, for this game isn't Minecraft. It has actual things to accomplish in a story. 
So, how is the more linear side of this open world sandbox? Well, first off, the game starts out great. It immediately puts you into a linear story segment with no title screen or anything. You get a basic tutorial of how to interact with Zelda! You get to learn about the Zonai. I'll be honest, I don't give a darn about the Zonai. They're a pretty boring Sheikah replacement in my opinion, but the opening did a great job of tricking me into thinking they'd be cool. But suddenly, wha-bam! Ganon's back! And wha-bam! Zelda's gone! And wha-bam! Link's arm and the Master Sword are busted! This is a great intro to a fairly disappointing tutorial area. I really did not vibe with the Sky Islands. They were far too linear, didn't offer up much variety, and it was way too reminiscent of the Great Plateau. A much superior tutorial in my opinion. It was still very intriguing though, and even though the annoying trumpet background music really did get on my nerves, the great visuals mixed with the fun puzzles kept me going. After you dive down to the ground, you do some fairly linear and uninteresting back and forth talking, get bored, and run off to explore. After exploring, for a bit, you eventually find your first dungeon. Dungeons in this game are no longer divine bre- <laughs> Dungeon th Dungeons in this game are no longer divine beasts, and they have their own unique themes and look visually distinct and stunning. They also have banger music, helping them be more memorable. The lead-ups to dungeons are spectacular, typically, maybe the best parts of the entire game, and the bosses usually slap, despite them being way too easy. This leaves only the dungeons themselves being unpraised, and to be honest, they're just as bland gameplay-wise as the Breath of the Wild dungeons. The puzzles are usually cute, but they are no more impressive than shrine puzzles. The dungeons are also really easy to break, and desperately needed more linearity. I will admit, I had a lot of fun in the Lightning Dungeon, it was my favorite dungeon in the game, and I really enjoyed the thematically coherent puzzles and the phenomenal lead-up, but the rest of them were eh. Zoro's Domain definitely has it the worst, having an extremely boring buildup, an okay lead-up, and a dungeon so forgettable that I don't even remember if I liked it or not. I remember the puzzles, but I forgot my emotions when playing them. WARNING! More heavy spoilers ahead! There will be no story spoilers, but I will be talking about the dungeon rewards and the story. Skip to the time on screen to avoid spoilers. The rewards you get for beating Dungeons are the Sages, which is this game's items. After skipping through the repeated old Sage explaining cutscenes, you get to use the Sage's abilities to help you deal with things. They're all cool abilities that are helpful for different situations, especially Tulin, but they're all implemented very clunkily. You have to press A when you're near a Sage to use their ability, but you use A for a lot of different things, and when you have multiple of them out, oh, it's a disaster. I love that they make the world feel less lonely since they explore with you, but they do not work in this form and are maybe the most unpolished aspects of this game. I do not like the story. I'll say it, this is my least favorite Zelda story by a bit. There's three major problems in the story in this game. 1. For whatever godforsaken reason, you see the memories out of order still. 2. The Zona in my opinion are very uninteresting and make the lore really messy. 3. Most interesting things people theorized about in Breath of the Wild are explained here and turn out to be very uninteresting explanations. I do have one big personal gripe with this game's story, however, and that's the fact that the Divine Beasts, the Towers, the Shrines, the Sheikah Slate, and the Guardians are all gone without an explanation. Sure, you can find references to them, but there's no reason for them to have just up and vanished. I was theorizing like crazy why they were gone and why we didn't have the Sheikah Slate anymore, only for a friend to tell me they were removed with no in-game explanation. When I found this out, I was shook. I was genuinely disturbed such a ridiculous thing could make it into this game and I had to put the game down. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't really been putting in much effort to avoid spoilers. I've already seen everything there is to story-wise and I don't regret it, the story's just that uninteresting. I guess I should go over a few miscellaneous points now. I'm not really a fan of this game's side quests. There are a lot more fetch quests and I haven't even dared to do the fairy fountain side quests yet. There are quite a few cool side quests and I really love the new side adventures, but the mid was far more apparent this time. There's still not a ton of enemy variety which can make the enemies get stale. I also like a lot of the new Korak challenges, but my god, those transportation ones. I already hated the rock throwing Koroks from Breath of the Wild, but oh my god. God, these transportation ones are the worst. Overall, I truly love this game, and I'm still having a great time playing this game, despite its flaws. I genuinely love getting lost in this world and will continue to play it for as long as possible. The time clocked in doesn't lie, and despite the gripes and disappointments, this is worthy of the 3D Zelda status. Pikmin as a series appeals to me a lot. 
I've played all of the Pikmin games in anticipation for Pikmin 4 and love them all dearly. The first most noticeable thing when I started Pikmin 4 was the new perspective. The camera is positioned behind your back rather than above you. You also have the ability to jump when riding on your companion, Ochi, allowing for unrivaled exploration in this series. Just the ability to be able to look into the distance and see the sky and trees, plus the ability to hop around and scale things makes this feel like the biggest Pikmin game. I was a little worried about the visuals since in the trailers the game looked very dry, but in game everything looks absolutely gorgeous. There's a lot of variety in the places you go, and each area has its own unique gimmicks. There's also a lot of atmosphere. You can hear a bird song while you're in the overworld, and the wide variety of creatures makes this world feel very real. In this game, you create your own character. This does mean your character doesn't really have a personality, but there's so many options for customization that it's worth the trade-off. You also have a dog companion named Ochi. Ochi works as a controllable partner and can do things that you can't, such as jumping, charging, and transporting heavy items. The player has the ability to charge Pikmin and climb things, meaning they both have their strengths and weaknesses. They make for the best duo in the whole series. Since you don't have all your options unless you're together, it also means the game is less about multitasking and more about planning, which is fine by me. The main gameplay consists of collecting treasures, exploring caves, and fighting off hostile creatures. Dandori is put into full effect here. If you don't know what a Dandori is, it's the ability to strategize and complete tasks, which is what Pikmin is all about. Despite the camera shift, it is still at heart a strategy game about doing things as quickly and efficiently as possible, and I love it. I love this whole series. Multitasking is my passion. I love games like Stardew Valley, Pikmin, Help. Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is my second favorite game ever, and all that is is time management. Pikmin as a series masters this concept, and this game is proof of that. This game manages to do even more than that, though. This game is not only the culmination of all the previous Pikmin games' best attributes, but it's also a love letter to Pikmin 2. I love Pikmin 2, but it's probably overall my least favorite of the four. The overworld exploration is limited, the caves while being awesome are big pace breakers, and the end of the game goes so overboard with enemy spam and insta-kill hazards that I haven't even been able to beat it. I'm stuck on the final boss, it's just too hard for me. Pikmin 4 fixes all of these issues. The caves are back, but they're only around 5 floors max this time. They aren't randomly generated anymore and are completely human designed, which might hurt replay plays a little, but it allows for the most intricate and interesting caves that we possibly could have gotten. A little bit of time passes on the overworld when you enter them as well, fixing one of Pikmin 2's plot holes. Something that Pikmin 4 did not keep from Pikmin 2 is the challenge, unfortunately. Most of the game you can breeze through it if you're experienced. Ice Pikmin are plentiful and take out enemies quickly, and Ultra Spicy Sprays make Pikmin melt enemy health bars. Most bosses in this game die to a single Ultra Spicy Spray and Ochi Charge. It's incredibly disappointing considering Pikmin 2's brutal boss fights. There were rarely ever surprises with bosses though the game did get me a few times. Another problem this game has is that you get some abilities and items far too late. There are tons of abilities that would be helpful if you got them early on, but most are useless later on when you get them. Also, a lot of Pikmin are barely used in the main game, looking at you whites. Personally, I think if they add a new game plus mode where you can go back to the beginning with all your abilities in Pikmin, but the game was remixed to be harder, it could be non-issue. Fingers crossed it happens soon. Anyways, Pikmin 4 manages to do a lot more than just be a love letter. This game introduces a lot of new things. It introduces side quests, which you can accept from the main hub. The side quests are fun things to do while playing the main game and are perfect for Pikmin. There's also the Dandori challenges and Dandori battles. Dandori challenges are about collecting as many items as possible in a short amount of time, and are extremely challenging and rewarding. There's also the Dandori battles, which are boss fights against CPUs to see who can collect the most things while sabotaging each other. Each Dandori battle adds upon itself and becomes more challenging and varied the further you go. I don't know if I'm a fan of the split screen, but I get it's just trying to get the player used to the two player mode. Speaking of, there's a two player mode now. I haven't tried them, but I'm sure it's fun and a great challenge to do with friends. Something they advertised heavily in the trailers is going out at night. During the night, you can play a tower defense game to protect a hive while using glow pikmin. This is where the main story gets its hardest, and these segments are extremely rewarding. It's surprising how well they work with the game, and I'd love to play more of these. The story is mostly good, I don't want to say anything to avoid spoilers, but it was decent. I'm not in love with any of the non-Ochi characters characters, but it's compelling. Something I don't like is the characters constantly talking during gameplay. It kind of takes away the atmosphere and makes me feel like the team is kind of annoying. I might as well bring up the intrusivity. Pretty much all of the Pikmin games are intrusive, and while this is the least intrusive Pikmin game, it's still obnoxiously handholdy. Characters never shut up during gameplay, the tutorials are horrendously invasive, and constantly being forced to read ID badges every time you find a new lost person is annoying. The best example of Pikmin 4's intrusivity is the controls. The pointer is now fully lock-on, you no longer get the free movement. It's constantly snapping to things to lock on, and it makes this game very jarring to play sometimes. You could have two things you want to throw Pikmin at, something in front of you and something beside you. You could throw Pikmin at one 
one thing and then you turn to throw it at the other thing, but unfortunately your lock on is still stuck to the first thing, so you accidentally throw another Pikmin at that instead. It wasn't too bad at first, but it gets really aggravating later on, especially during some of the challenges. It's also shockingly hard to get more Pikmin to carry things once the max required to carry it are latched on. Overall, I love Pikmin 4. It has amazing Dandori gameplay, incredibly atmospheric worlds, fun side content, and lots of character. It's probably my favorite of the Pikmin games, despite its flaws. I'd recommend going for 100% and will definitely be coming back to this game for more Pikmin Bliss. Overall, this year has had a lot of games that stole my heart. All of these games are important pieces of what made my 2023, and I think they're all must-plays. Compare this to last year, I only had two games to talk about. This year, I had seven. Seven games I truly loved. The fact that most of the games I played on this list hit the 8 out of 10 mark is a great sign of the art from this year, and all of these games are great. But history repeats itself. This year, I had two games I was considering for my game of the year. One of them is a game from a series I've become dangerously obsessed with this year and can't get out of my head. The other is a game that blew me away with its quality and pure euphoric gameplay. These two games, of course, are Pikmin 4 and Mario Wonder. Debating in my head which deserves Game of the Year was hard. Pikmin 4 might be my favorite Pikmin game, and I'm overly in love with this series. I played this game to 100% completion and actually started a new playthrough just for this video. I haven't gotten very far because working on this video has taken a lot of my free time, but the fact I wanted to squeeze it in just shows how much I love this game. But it has issues. Lots of issues. The pointer is a really big bother, and the very low difficulty sometimes makes me wish I was playing Pikmin 1 or 2. But there really isn't anything like Pikmin, and this game absorbed me and gave me a safe haven. I could shrink down and explore a beautiful backyard, watching my Pikmin bring back treasures, then go spelunking into a dangerous cave. This game really does have it all. Mario Wonder, on the other hand, was a surprise to me. I was not expecting to feel Mario Odyssey levels of bliss from a 2D Mario. Collecting Wonder Seeds is so satisfying. The transformations and interesting level designs were constantly keeping me on my toes. The fact you can roam around on the overworld map and find secrets is just everything I could have wanted from a 2D Mario. I can't even believe how euphoric this game is, and euphoric isn't a word I use lightly. This is truly one of the most fun, creative, satisfying games I think I'll ever play, and well yes, I prefer games like Odyssey, Super Paper Mario, and of course Sunshine. This is an incredibly strong entry into the Mario series, and stands strong as a true, genuine masterpiece. I will admit that despite this game truly teaching me 2D games can surpass 3D games, I have to confess I prefer 3D games still, and the moment-to-moment -moment ability to stare into the distance in Pikmin 4 and observe the background really passes this game. Oh, wait, they have interesting camera stuff on the map? Damn it, this is hard. My last thing to mention is that I haven't beaten Mario Wonder, so I can't be sure that it doesn't tank in the end, but I seriously doubt it does. So here's my predicament. Pikmin 4 is an overwhelmingly charming, polished game that evolves one of my favorite game series, but is far too handholdy. The pointer controls, low difficulty, and constant interruptions and characters talk can keep it from its full potential, but despite the immersion breaks, I still get sucked in every time I play. Mario Wonder is a blissful romp through the best levels in any 2D platformer, ripe with constant surprises, challenging platforming, and so many cute little details that make this game the whole package. I love almost everything about this game, and it has no real holdbacks. It is a very safe option for my number one, however, and I once again haven't beaten it. My head tells me Pikmin 4 is more unique and deserves the award, but my heart tells me I had more fun with Mario Wonder, and that its relative lack of flaws and great flow make it deserve the award. Today, I choose to listen to my heart. My game of the year is Gollum. Nah, just kidding. I choose Mario Wonder as my game of the year. Wait, something's happening. I feel a strange feeling in me. H who are you? Hello there, Kazooie. I'm your anti-form. You're nobody. My name is anti Skull Kid. Wait, do you mean you're like an evil version of me that's going to challenge my perspectives and opinions? Every creature needs one. I've been degraded to cliches, no! And as for why I'm here, I couldn't help but eavesdrop on this little charade. You really chose a basic 2D platformer with your cute little soulless mascot man over a game from a niche series made with love. You're barely a critic, your opinions are dog shit. It, it was a tough decision, I love both games. Yet you give such a basic game to your top spot. You haven't even played most of the beloved games from this year. These are barely impressive. I know these games aren't perfect. I know that other games may have been more revolutionary, but these are the ones I played. 
And even though they all have flaws or limitations, I enjoyed them all. Just because Pokemon Sleep is a mobile game, it doesn't mean it didn't impact me greatly in a positive way. Just because Future Redeem was short, it doesn't mean I didn't get a lot from it. Just because I don't play Fortnite as much anymore, it doesn't mean I don't cherish my memories from when I played it daily. Just because Tears of the Kingdom was flawed, it doesn't mean it wasn't a massive and highly respectable and impressive Zelda. Just because Mario RPG is basic compared to other games, it doesn't mean I can't love it just as much or more than what those games are for what it is. Just because Mario Wonder is an obvious choice for my game of the year, it doesn't mean that it doesn't deserve it. And just because Pikmin 4 didn't win, it doesn't mean that I don't love it as much as I do. Oh really? A long repetitive sphere? All you did was this the obvious, you barely even create original criticism. Listen, I may not be unique, or popular, or important, but the important thing is I try. I try every day to write my opinions down, to express them, so that people may latch onto them and relate to them. My job isn't to be perfect, my job is to try my best to make something that people can find. Even if one kid's day is improved by what I do, I've done my job. This is growing tiring. It's time to end this once and for all. Whoa! <clears throat> ah. Where am I? This is your humble reality. The real world. It seemed fitting to end your life in your own reality. We are stripped of your power. Listen, I know you're strong. But I have one thing that you'll never have. I have the power to review things. Whoa! My critic sword. Prepare to be vanquished. You think that piece of junk can scratch me? I summon forth the demons of the games you've sought to praise. Fall to your own feelings. I use my critic power. Ah, 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 ah. You're strong, but I have something that you'll never have. I respect people's opinions no matter what they are. Ah, Let's see if you can handle my conflict of your own fears. Listen, I love all the games I've played this year, and just because some of them may be simple or flawed, it doesn't mean you're going to take this away from me. You moron. I'm completely invincible in this state. There's nothing you can do. Your positivity means nothing. Your critiques mean nothing. There is nothing you can do to stop me now. I think I know what I need to do. Ah, I'll use this wonder flower to finally get together the courage of the games that I like. Ah. Listen, just because I disagree with you, it doesn't mean I have the right to stop you. Your opinions are valid and you have the right to share them, but you need to find a manner that's respectful and you need to chill. There's no reason to scream or harass people or especially cause fandom wars. Just be mindful and find a productive way to express your thoughts. You definitely found a lot of things to critique about me. Just imagine how fun a video of you critiquing a game could be. <laughs> You're so stupid. So incredibly stupid. I'll be back. I'll haunt you for the rest of your life. I'll continue to torture you. I'll be back. Wow, that was something. I kind of feel like they were right about a lot of things. But that doesn't matter. I want to continue working to create art that people can enjoy. This is year one of something that I want to continue for the near future. I love reviewing things I always have, even since I was young. And now that I have the maturity and knowledge to express my thoughts, I want to continue. So, I just want to say to you, the viewer, thank you. Thank you for being here with me, thank you for letting me do this. Creating these silly videos has been an honor, and I want to do more things. In fact, if I play all those games I missed out on in 2023, I might make a sequel to this video, or a part two. But until then, I'll continue working to make videos. I'll continue to play games, watch movies, and write reviews. My time here is running short, but I genuinely, truly wish you a very lovely day. Before I finish off this video, I'd like to thank my grandmother for sitting through this entire video and watching a bunch of this. She doesn't give a darn about video games, but she still sat down and watched every segment after I was done, except for the final few, so thank you a lot for helping and encouraging me. It really did help. Anyways, to everyone, go have a great one, you deserve it, and see you in the next video.